here in NCPOD, who I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, and they are the National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcome and Death, and use um, a minimized case note review methodology to examine critically um, uh, medical and surgical topic areas, um, and they do that through multidisciplinary teams um, that assess those anonymized case notes. And look at the quality of care being provided to patients, and also the organisational features of, of the of the trust. They produce a series of recommendations um, based on the particular topic area they're reviewing, and they so. Um, make available local audit toolkits uh, on their website to help support local action planning for each of their reports. And I think very key uh, to, to their success, and, 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 and they're always very uh, keen for, our, for to emphasise this, is that they wouldn't be able to do any of this without the support of their local reporters in every single trust around the country and those local reporters are made up of audit staff and clinicians and, and absolutely key to their success. So I'm just going to take you to two examples, there are many, many more and these two examples um, come from some poster submissions that uh, came into NCPOD and NCPOD um, do a call for um, submissions of best practice and how people have used uh, their recommendations to improve services uh, locally um, and um, these are some of the ones that have previously been submitted. I'm just going to take you through two of them um, but just to also let you know that they are doing a further call for submissions January. Um, but Marissa Mason, Chief Executive, said anybody is very uh, welcome to submit their post before then and they'll take that forward and they want uh, at the launch of their reports, all of these posters um, are, are, are displayed and, and it's a real opportunity for people to come and share uh, their learning and best practice. So I've just put the link in on this slide to all of the posters, uh, two of which I'm going to talk about now. This example I'm just going to take you through comes from Southport and Ormskirk uh, Hospitals HS Trust. And, um, they... <clears throat> undertook some local action planning based on the um, court report uh, measuring the units uh, which was published in 2013 and looked at and examined patient, the care of patients who were admitted to hospital with alcohol related liver disease and very pertinent today I think because I was just um, noticing that there's a public health England report out today that says um, that alcohol related liver disease has actually increased by over 40% in the past 12 years. So this is a real issue that impacts on, on, on many, many patients admitted um, to, to trust and the country. So an, an audit of alcohol documentation uh, in their patients, and um, they focused on two key recommendations from that report. The first was that all patients presenting to hospital services should be screened for alcohol mis misuse, um, taking a, a, a good history, um, looking at the number of units drunk per week, drink pattern, indicators of dependence. And they made that, they owned that for themselves um, by making a commitment that but within their trust, all patients should have a screening tool completed asking patients about their alcohol consumption. The second recommendation from the report was that all patients presenting to acute services with a history of potential harmful drinking should be referred to alcohol support services for comprehensive physical and mental assessment. And they made the commitment that patients who would score over seven um, on that uh, on that screening should be referred to uh, the alcohol liaison specialist nurse who would go on to undertake a severity of alcohol dependency questionnaire. Their results, <clears throat> well, they, they did undertook a very uh, a baseline audit and they looked at 50 e cards and five sets of notes from every patient. Uh, oh, sorry, for, for, from patients across every ward in the trust, and a, a total of, of 109 patients. And then they repeated their audit five months later, and they looked at 98 A&E cards and 60 sets of notes uh, from, from uh, across all of their wards, uh, around 158 patients. 
patients. And what they found was um, that um, patients having alcohol screening went from 44 to 74% in any and they're already doing quite well on inpatient wards, but there it increased from 86 to 93%. Um, the number of patients uh, that scored over 7 went from 10 to 34. And the number of patients being referred to alcohol liaison specialist went 7 to 28. And then they um, also um, went on to, to, to implement some general improvements across the trust. Now, the... Um, um, our liaison team uh, provided training across all wards and particularly uh, for A&E staff um, and they also um, did this, undertook train the trainer where they uh, went on to have champions on, on wards and particularly in A&E put around lots of posters and I guess our key message was around this is, this is everybody's role, this isn't just about the alcohol liaison team doing undertaking these assessments. This is something we should all be doing uh, when 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 um, patients are being admitted to the trust, and this is a public health service that we can provide. So I've just acknowledged um, those people who submitted that poster um, to to NCPod, and as I said, it is available on the NCPod uh, website. And the next example I'm going to share with you comes from Wrightington, Wigan and Lee uh, NHS Trust. And they used an NCPOD report called The Time to Intervene, uh, which was published in 2012. And this particular report looked at cardiac arrest procedures uh, in trust. And this particular uh, trust decided that they would focus in particular on their cardiorespiratory unit, where they had the no highest number of arrests across the whole trust. And undertook an audit and a case note uh, review of cardiac uh, arrests. Um, they did this over 12 months, and during that period, they looked at 24 arrests. The issues that were identified in this particular report was an uh, issue uh, where issues relating to failure to recognise deteriorating patients, uh, issues relating to involving senior clinicians, and issues are relating to making prompt and appropriate do not resuscitate decisions. So findings for them when they undertook this, this review and this, this audit um, was for them in particular there were issues around senior review. They realised that the average time from last senior review of a of patient was actually before arrest was uh, an average of 29 hours uh, and that ranged from to 67 and 13% of the patients they looked at had no senior review in the preceding 24 hours before their arrest. They also particularly focused in on uh, um, observations and um, where observations were, uh, were normal and they um, ascertained that 50% of the patients had had a modified warning score of three or more prior to their arrest. 25% had not been escalated appropriately. And finally, they looked at the issue of do not resuscitate and ceilings of care. And they felt that on review of case notes that uh, over 50% of the patients uh, had had um, and that there were issues that needed to be discussed around that uh, uh, and whether or not uh, or how appropriate that had been in view of the patient's pre-morbid state. So what do? Um, they um, introduced... Uh, a ward and checklist, and in particular, a prompt to regularly review ceilings of care uh, for patients um, around decision making uh, and end of life care. They introduced monthly mortality review meetings in which all patients who died were discussed, with particular focus on looking at the ceiling of care and end of life decisions. They also introduced uh, weekend respiratory consultant reviews. And, um, couldn't replicate it here, but on your post you'll see they had one chart and um, their pre action plan. They, they were having on average um, between two and six arrests per month, and that went down uh, to between zero and two um, after uh, they implemented their action plan. So I'm, just, I'm coming close to the end of my time. I've just got to one more slide, I think. Um, so I just want to briefly take you through the other um, clinical outcome review program I wanted to highlight to you, which is the mental health um, program. And again, just to summarise, the current supplier is 
N. Kish, and are the National Confidential Inquiry into Suicide and Homicide by People with Mental Illness. And look and collect. They look at data relating to suicide and homicides by people with a mental illness in contact with secondary care services. So this isn't all suicides. It's suicides of, of people with a mental illness in contact with secondary care services. But they make up just under 30 percent of all general population suicides. We can also undertake topic-based studies. Some of the ones they've done recently, and you can have a look at on the website, are relating to. Uh, the process of risk assessment prior to suicide, um, and, and also um, organisational features of mental health trusts and how these relate to trust suicide uh, rates. And again, they produce uh, a toolkit, uh, which is available at the link below. And I also just want to mention um, another toolkit that's available, uh, which is the um, MPSA, NHS England Suicide Prevention Toolkit, which again, um, it was a collaboration with NKISH and has many of the, well, has all of the recommendations uh, made by NKISH and allows you a, a, a means by which you can as, a, a assess your outcome based on those uh, 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 recommendations. Finally, just to flag up, um, they, um, NKISH uh, recently, well, in 2012, published a study in The Lancet. Uh, which describe, which looks at, two, which looked at two questions, and those questions were: firstly, did trust actually, did mental trust, health trust actually implement their recommendations? Um, and secondly, did they have a positive effect on reducing uh, suicide? So the answer to both those questions in their in their study, which was published in the Lancet, was yes. Um, and mental health providers were asked if and when they had implemented the nine key recommendations that had come from NKISH. The period of the study, Trust had increasingly implemented those recommendations. A majority of the nine recommendations had been in, implemented in the majority of Trusts. And the next, of course, very important question was what impact the recommendations had had on Trust suicide rates. And um, they had all had a, a positive effect in terms of reducing uh, suicide rates, but the three that had uh, were stati statistic significant were um, the availability of 24-hour crisis teams, the availability of a dual diagnosis policy, that's for patients who have both a mental health and alcohol drug related uh, diagnosis, and those trusts that had a safety culture um, and a culture of learning where following a serious untoward instance, they undertook multidisciplinary review. And just to finally say that the, um, the, or the figures on the right-hand side were where they looked at the specificity of the recommendations. So did the recommendations make, make for specific patient subgroups have the effect of reducing suicide in those subgroups, um, in those patient groups? And again, as you can see here, they did. So, for example, their recommendation about ligature points, um, the availability of ligature points, and, and, and the introduction of collapsible rails on inpatient units were targeted at inpatients, and there was a, a fall in suicide rates by 24% following the introduction of that recommendation, and so on. You can see the other recommendations there and the subsequent uh, fall in suicide. I'm going to pass you over to Kate Godfrey, or I'm going to pass the presenting rights to Kate. I'm just trying to see where she is here. Out the top. Where are you, Kate? Hello. Hi. Sorry, I might have to move your slide. Oh, I can see you now. Okay. Oh, you've got them. Great. Over to Kate. Okay, Kate. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm just going to really go through an example from one particular organisation, uh, which is King's College. And that because what they've done is that they've developed a framework that cover all of their national clinical units. And this framework actually enables them to, to know much more about and ensure that they have full participation, that they're about the reporting and the findings of each audit, that action planning is actually put in place and improvement is monitored. And it's all from one specific framework to cover uh, the trust as a whole. Yeah, I think they do what what, we, what everybody does, which is you know the, the way that they identify 
which audits they want to participate in is through the Quality Accounts webpage. So which they really need to, to do. And that's a, a pretty full uh, number of, of audits to participate in. So there's, there's plenty there. And they then do, and again, I think many trusts do this to some extent, is they take those and they make very clear to the division management which relevant national clinical audits they are to, to participate in. And that's uh, the responsibility of the medical director, sometimes uh, to a nominated assistant medical director to do that. Clinical audit lead will keep that division informed of what the key requirements are for each audit and dates of participation and when they have to supply the data and things like that. In the division, they have a quality governance lead and they again have very specific roles and limit, uh, within this framework. And I think that's one of the key things for this is that they have individual understand exactly what it is they need to do as to, to ensure improvement assurance following national clinical audit participation. So what the quality governance leads to do is they ensure that each of the audits has a designated audit lead and that these audit leads senior clinicians. And again, they're very clear about the responsibilities of those senior clinicians. So it's not just about, oh yes, and you're responsible for the audit. They'd be responsible for coordinating the participation, for ensuring the data quality, doing the audit report and doing improvement. And I think it's that being specific about what being an audit lead needs is really helpful. The governance leads are also responsible for ensuring that the registration is completed and the data submitted in line with the deadlines set by whichever audit supplier it is. And also where there may be issues around non-participation that immediately addressed within the division, so everything is kept local and, and close to, 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 to the patient and these decision making. It can't be resolved there, but it is quickly um, escalated up to the Clinical Effectiveness Committee. So things are picked up quickly before they're due to be submitted right than after the event. When reporting around performance in the, in the audit, it really depends. As we all know, each audit is very different, it looks at different things and reports differently because of that. So they, it depends what the audit is as to what, which committee it goes to. I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm only trying to give you an overview flavour, really, of this. So if you need more detail, please go to our website. Um, the whole case study is on underneath the case studies section of our website, and it's just been updated this morning because they've recently reviewed the whole process and they made some changes to it. So if you've visited it in the past, please do visit it again. But as an example about the reporting, so there is trust level mortality data, that will go to the Mortality Monitoring Committee. If they find that there is a real quality issue in our data, the actual mission involved will report that to make sure that that goes into the risk management monitoring system of the trust. So report it as an incident. All of the audits are subject to review with the aim of identifying any areas uh, which are clinically or the process improvements can be made and making action access action to address these. What the effective department do to enable this is they produce two um they've got templates and then these are available on our website so King's are very happy for you to share these. One is an executive summary of the audit itself and the other is around headline data and that's on a PowerPoint slide so that can easily be presented or put it off. Headline data data slide is very much promoting what they're doing well as well as for improvement. So the organization as a whole is aware, aware of where they're actually performing above average on certain things as well as being able to act on areas of concern. But the executive summary and the headline data, which is again filled out by the uh, effectiveness department with the lead clinician for the audit, and it goes to the clinical effectiveness committee and specific standards that that must reach the committee within four to six weeks of publication of the report. So then therefore it enables the committee to have sight of the data at the earliest opportunity so decisions can be made quickly. The query areas of low compliance, so you know, looking more into, into why that may be, and also help to risk rate it as well, so identify areas that require immediate attention. And um, review the actions that have already been agreed at directorate level or divisional level, and also possibly suggest additional actions 
questions or may request further feedback from the division around areas where they're not, not quite sure why the results are as they are. That will then a headline report plus what key actions have been decided to do and then be passed up to the organisation again. So what you're getting is the key areas of, of information going to the key places. So nobody overwhelmed with with data so they can see what it is they're supposed to be they're supposed to know about. So just those key actions and the headline results go to the outcomes committee, the core governance committee, that is up to the board as one of their papers. It's also available for commissioners and of course regulators should they need it, should they require it, particularly before a visit. The outlining itself is developed by the audit lead themselves or the other, maybe, maybe that they delegate that to another senior clinician, but it must be a senior clinician. And they will then work with the rest of the division and the relevant stakeholders. Nobody's working in isolation, developing and just writing out an audit plan. It absolutely states within the framework that they must work with all relevant stakeholders to ensure that the action plan is actionable. Uh, this then monitored locally, so the implementation of that and, and the progress of that will dealt with at divisional level. And reviewed six months annually, depending on the issues uh, raised by the relevant trust level committee. So as I mentioned before, if it's uh, mortality data, it will be the mortality committee. It may be a subcommittee looking at improvement from the patient outcome committee. So they will know who that is because they have a clear framework that, that demonstrates which report goes to where. And if there are having problems implementing actions or it's just not happening, there's a clear escalation route that goes straight to the Patient Outcomes Committee. So just finally, just to give you a couple of examples of where they feel that this has demonstrated that it's worked well. It's the part of the National Neonatal Audit Programme. They found that actually, you know, if they were looking at babies with a gestational age of less than 32 weeks or any one uh, 1,501 grams at birth. They need to undergo that retinopathy of prematurity ROP screening. Uh, they found that they were only at 28% and they should improve this to 100. As it happened, when she did a case review of this, they did find that all the babies had been screened for ROP. It wasn't being documented on the local database. They only had paper copies of that. It wasn't being done electronically. So what they did then was, of course, they, they um, managed to go back a year and put it on retrospectively for 2013. But in order to ensure that it goes on in the future, the ophthalmologist now has, has access to the database and he can enter or she can enter the screen results prospectively and contemporaneously. So an example is with the NJR. And they were finding that the case ascertainment rates, consent, and linkability rates were all below, uh, were lower than they wanted them to be. The consent rate was 85, for example, but they managed to get that up to 99. And with case ascertainment, they managed to get to 54 to, you know, as usual with case ascertainment, they were up to 110. And what they did here was, you know, just some simple things just to make sure that there's a, it's about availability and people understanding what it is they need to do. So then it made the NJR forms available at points of operation in each of the relative theatres that did hips and knees, for example. Also, the surgeon was reminded that they have to complete the NJR form through, and this isn't partly through a daily reminder from the senior clinician who would say, you know, every day you need to do this, do not forget to do this. Um, any incomplete forms are returned to the surgeon to complete. So you're getting much more uh, of complete data in there. And to, to facilitate this, what they did was they created an admin post which had specific role for data submission support. I think that's, there's a couple of examples there of, of how they found the framework useful. The other thing is that, that, that now at trust level they have an idea across the board of all of the audits that they participate in, where they are and how they perform. So that's all I have to say really and um, just any questions. Thank you very much, Jenny and Kate, for both of your presentations. We do have questions come in. Uh, our first question is for um, Kate, I believe, although Jenny, you might want to chip in. Our first question asks, 
Do you have a sense of how well commissioners use recommendations from any audit reports to influence both their commissioning or any details within their contracts with the providers? I hit that one. Jenny? Yes, Kate, thanks. Right. Yeah, we don't know the answer, and uh, NHS England aren't very clear either. So we're working with them to uh, produce some guidance for commissioners on how to use it. So there's two ways in which we are hoping that they will really start to use it. There's one to actually use the information from the trusts to it to as assurance, but also to commission audits across sectors so that they can actually. Um, start to follow patient pathways as originally agreed, you know, that, that, that commissioning would follow pathways rather than just sort of lump sums a few hips and knees here and, you know, we'll have a look, something else over there. So actually using it to be able to do that. So that's that's two, two of the things that we're hoping that they will do. So we will be producing some guidance for them and um, also be doing some workshops, some new workshops specifically for CSUs and CCGs. Okay, that's really helpful. I think that really helps to um, get an answer to that question. Um, we have another question um, asking what a respective action plan would include and how you might go about engaging um, all of the stakeholders in the action plan and also uh, are the key stakeholders that we should in, in, engage in the action plan really to make it really successful? Okay, just take that one as well. Yeah, and I can add to it. Okay, cool. Right, can you just repeat the, the key bits of it again? Sorry. So, I think I was asking what key items should be included in an action plan. Any advice for engaging the key stakeholders in the action plan and also who the stakeholders are that should um, should be included, really? Right. Okay, well, the key items, that, that's what needs to be decided by whoever's leading it and the stakeholders. Um, in national audit, I'll certainly not say, oh, it's just anything that we're less than average on, uh, because they move all the time. So you might be average this year, but you won't be average next year because everybody else will have moved up. So it is, it is about looking at things that you can act on, number one. Um, if not, then identifying resources for the future for those. Uh, but also looking at how there, there's, a, there's a specific um, piece of work that's been done by the Asian Society that really looks at the team together, working at what can be done easily and then scoring that against how effective it will be. And for each of those two questions on each action from a one to seven, multiply them and then you can pick up the things that are easy to implement and have a bigger impact and actually prioritise what actions you're going to take that way. When it comes to agreeing who those stakeholders are, the key aspect there is, are they involved in that care in any way? So any change that is going to take place, if they're involved in that in that process, they need to be involved. And obviously, we, we strongly believe that patients need to be involved in those sorts of decision-making because they can really add to, to, to sort of about how things can be better. So, you know, so they will have ideas having been through the process about where the pitfalls are. So patients are extremely useful and they'll also be very quick to tell you whether the changes you've made have been effective or not. So again, it's about sitting down with the lead clinician and whoever's facilitating that improvement work, actually working out who your stakeholders are. And there are, there are quite a few tools about that, about you know, to decide who's an important stakeholder and who isn't. Um, and there's further information on the website around that too. Okay. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, I think, um, you know, we we say with NH because there are always for the audiences, and I, and I guess it's always worth, you know, it's, your stakeholders are going to change depending on, on, on what it is you're doing. But generally speaking, patients, absolutely, patient groups, patient representatives, um, decision makers within the trust, your clinicians, and, um, you know, if you're looking to change commissioning of services, then you want to be including your commissioners. So I think, you know, just to, to reiterate what Kate was saying, it's about sitting down at the very start and look at who are you trying to influence, who do you need to try and engage with. Um, and then, of course, with any, uh, any change, um, really trying to get your enthusiasts 
that's on board because there will be enthusiasts across the trust who will, be, who will want to, to support you. Um, and, I, I, you know, the idea of of sectors that uh, Omskirk used, where they they went on to to have champions on each of the wards, was uh, they felt very key to their success. Thank you. I'd just like to very very quickly touch on one more question. So, so sorry to those of you who um, haven't had your questions answered, but please do join us on Twitter tonight where we can talk about this a bit further. And um, just one very quick question that's come in. I'd like to ask you both. Um, it mentions that action planning is often limited by funding in competing parties. Ask whether you know of any algorithms to weigh the cost of um, some actions against either the benefits or gains that the action may have. Is there anything that you've come across? So look at um, the benefit of an action. Okay. And no. I, I, is it a question around the cost of it? Uh, the, um, I guess it's about the cost benefit, isn't it? Really, what they're saying. If it's down, you know how, how useful will this action be? There aren't any specific algorithms for that because it depends whether it's stuff or whether it's kit, you know, equipment. And um, so, so one algorithm wouldn't fit at all. Um, it's about absolutely. I would say prioritising, seeing how you know, working out what the impact of of the resort will have on the action. Very clear about that, and then developing a business plan around that. And yeah, I'd absolutely, you know, reiterate that. I think it's about you know, it's about not trying to do anything too complex. But I think a simple business plan, um, uh, you, well, you call it a business plan, a plan where you can outline the benefits because I think that's that's that, you know in terms of patient outcome which might not necessarily require additional funding. I, I think in both of the two examples I gave, um I don't think there was a, there was a question of, of them requiring um additional funding. I mean there was obviously to to for the CREAC uh output where they were looking to have additional uh consultant at the weekend. But other than that a lot of the things that they implemented actually uh uh were, were immense benefit to patient outcomes and, and patient quality of care, um, but actually didn't really cost vast amounts of money. It was about reorganizing how they were delivering care. Thank you. Um, for some of you whose comments and questions we haven't been able to address uh, in today's webinar, but do join us on Twitter this evening from 6.30 in the hashtag clinical audit or following at HQIP. I hope you join us for tomorrow's webinar. If you haven't signed up and you'd like to, please do email HQIP and we can line you up um, as long as there are spaces left. And today's webinar is by Deborah O'Callaghan from uh, NICE, talking about using standards and guidance locally for successful measurement and improvement. The webinar has been recorded and then with the slides will be able, available on the HQIP website soon. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you've enjoyed it.